She was an activist, a revolutionary, and a leader in the fight against injustice of any kind. I knew everything that Sand did, but I didn't. I think I said as at one of the services, I'm very aware of what she accomplished, but I wasn't as aware of all the people's lives that she touched. Sometimes it can feel a little isolating in Spokane to connect to the larger black community, so I try my best to find out some things that are going on, not just locally, but around the country, and, and help us connect to those things. Hundreds gathered at the first Interstate Center of the Arts to celebrate her mark on the world. She was a sister. She was a daughter. And she was a friend. She loved black people. She loved community as well. But she really, really, really wanted to help the black community. For the next 30 minutes, we're reflecting on the life of Sandy Williams and paying tribute to her legacy. This is Sandy's story. This evening, we're taking a look back at the life of Sandy Williams. Whether she was advocating for the Carl Maxey Center or writing for the Black Lens, Sandy was constantly fighting for the world to be a better place. But she wasn't always the fearless leader that many of us came to know. I sat down with Sandy's mom, Wilhelmina, and brother Rick, who say that at her core, Sandy was an introvert, a sports fan who loved watching Little House on the Prairie, and most of all, a beloved mother, daughter, and sister. Are you older or younger than Sandy? I'm older. I'm her older brother. We are 11 months, 11 days apart. Sandy took pride in the fact that once a year we are the same age and I was no longer her older brother for 11 days and then we got to flip back. So, so I, it's safe to say you guys were pretty close growing up yeah. especially. The, one of the benefits of being in the military is that your family comes together. And so as we moved around, Sandy and I were very close. We played a lot. We did everything together. We started in South Carolina and then went to Germany, back to California, and then to Hawaii and here. Yeah. When we moved here, my husband said, that's enough. I don't want to move again. I was a freshman, a sophomore. Sophomore, she was a freshman in high school, at Cheney High School, and we were, it was time for us to move again. And I tell the story, my dad posed the question of, do you want to go? And we said, no, please, can we please stay and graduate in this school? We don't want to go to a school where we don't know anybody and then graduate. Mm -hmm. So he said, sure, but if I stay, I'm going to stay. And that's going to be it. And so that was it. He stayed and we got to graduate and it was great. So that was, that was I think, Sam's first. Um, she goes, we got to make dad make us stay. We want to stay. And so that, <laughs> was, that was her first advocacy moment. <laughs> just getting dad to not move again. Yeah. I love that. Was she always so just kind of fearless and outspoken? I, I wouldn't call her that, I, but I'd call her she was determined. I, I think Sandy was the, the person that uh, always wanted to advocate for the underdog. And whether it, it, that was we go out and try to get a Christmas tree in the Christmas tree lot, she wanted, the, she wanted the Charlie Brown Christmas tree, is what we said. And usually we wind up having to get two. We get the big one. And then we get the one Sandy picked, which was, you can't just leave this here. Look at this. It's so sad. Or we go to the, the pound. And we'd go get a dog. And we'd be over here looking at the, you know, the runt of the litter. And it's like, Sandy. And I'd be like, come on. Let's, look at this big German shepherd. Let's go. Nope. Nope. And we'd come home with, so... It was that, I, where that got baked in, I'm not sure, but I think, I mean, it was clearly there and we saw it yeah. every day. It was, we knew, we knew where, whatever the situation was, if there was uh, an underdog in that vicinity, Sandy was gonna advocate for it and we were gonna act, <laughs> we are gonna wind up <laughs> responding to it. And that's, yeah. that's how she did the whole time. And, and I'll say this last year, a lot of people don't know, she, she had, I mean, none of the things she was doing was making her wealthy. Um, it, she was just getting by and doing stuff, but as the, as the um, center got going and the papers started going, she was able to find her footing, and she made a commitment to herself. I'm, she goes, I'm 60 years old now. I need to um, start doing some stuff for myself. So what people don't know is that she started, I called it the Sandy Bucket List, and um, for her 60th birthday, she went skydiving, uh, I think over here in Airway Heights. And it's because she'd never done it. And she wanted me to go. And I said, you, you got to be kidding. <laughs> yes. and after that, she goes, I, I've always had a little bit of fear of horses. I want to learn how to ride a horse. So she went out 
to Cheney and took coursing, uh, uh, writing lessons. And, and then the last thing was she called on her having a great trip in, in the San Juan Islands and said, I've never been on a seaplane. I want to do the seaplane. So again, it was another series of firsts. So as sad as it was, it was her, it was her fulfilling her dreams and trying to now do all these things that she had not had the opportunity to do before. The day of the accident, she called, and Rick was there too. Mm -hmm. She had finished her vacation and was coming back, and she called us before she got on the plane. And she had a friend in, in uh, Seattle that heard the news or got some part of the news before we did it, so she called us and because uh, her friend knew their flight number and all, and then uh, Rick started backtracking, you know, the the flight numbers that she wasn't on, and there were times they didn't know anything either. So that was the hardest part: all the waiting and not knowing, you know, what was going on. It was a surreal time. I'm sure. Yeah. But we we came in. The the Navy came in and did their part. And and the other families of the other uh, 10 individuals that were lost, it, it's our nine other families. Um, it's a club you don't want to be in. It's a no. club that you're in. Um, and we're grateful for them. It's, it's um, the kind of the collective of, has held each other together during this, during this time. But as mom was saying, uh, yeah, the hardest part for mom was thinking about Sandy being in the cold water. They, <laughs> They both don't do cold very well. I don't. The family doesn't do cold very well, so <laughs> I shouldn't take myself out of it. So, um, so we were just relieved to uh, to get her back and and out of the water. And we we thank the Navy so much for doing that. As you said, not a not a place you want to be, but uh, and it took a long time for me to be able to sleep through the night because I would wake up and I'm visualizing that water, that cold water, and I didn't know if the plane just was slowly going down or went down. And now since then, it seems, the community seems to me at least to have really rallied behind Sandy's legacy and in trying to move forward and honoring her. And I know we were just talking about how, you know, people come up to you and want to share stories because I feel like just about everybody has a Sandy story. You know, I haven't been here that long, but I have Sandy <laughs> yeah. stories, you know. Yeah. She left such yeah. a huge impact. What's that like now with so many people, an entire city pretty much coming whenever they see you guys and it's instantly like, oh, well, let me share this or let me, is it overwhelming or is it a welcome experience? I think first, overall, the family is so grateful. We're just, I mean, um, Monika, her daughter, mom and I, the outpouring that we've gotten from Spokane has been unreal. And it's been, mm. um, it helped us get through this. Um, um, me coming up from California, I knew, I knew everything that Sand did, but I didn't, I think I said as, at one of the services, I'm very aware of what she accomplished, but I wasn't as aware of all the people's lives that she touched. And that's, the stories that we've been hearing. And mm -hmm. it's, as mom said, it, it's so appreciative and we're so grateful, but it does bring it back again. And, and um, But there's nowhere I go that someone doesn't come up and say, oh, are you Sandy Williams' brother? Are you Sandy Williams' brother? I'm gonna get a name tag that says I'm Sandy Williams' <laughs> brother. Um, yeah. And wear that with pride. But the, the stories they share of one thing she said, or a an action she took, or uh, being able to, to find their own inner voice and strength because they heard her stand up to power, mm. in a way. And and I and I think it wasn't in those stories we've told you about. You know, when she was growing up, she I think people saw it, saw it as authentic because it was never about her. She wasn't benefiting from this. She wasn't doing anything. And so I think they were able to rally around her and see here's someone that's just in it for the community, in it because it's right. Coming up next, those who knew Sandy professionally and personally share how they remember their mentor and friend. For a black person coming to Spokane, she could tell you how to survive Spokane. The community knew Sandy Williams as a leader, visionary, and pioneer for justice. 
but I got to spend time with people who knew her in the quiet moments, sharing jokes or talking over a game of dominoes. Here's how Sandy's close friends are honoring her memory. Sandy Williams. She really, really, really wanted to help the black community. The voice of those who were voiceless. She was many things to many people. And Sandy knew everyone. She knew who did what. And like she was the black business directory before it was online. She's always there for a black person coming to Spokane. She could tell you how to survive Spokane. But in as many roles as she filled, she leaves behind just as many holes. I felt just very seen by her. And so that kind of thing I miss, I really miss that about, about her. And I don't know if anybody else could do that. There's not a door or anywhere that she could go in. She never compromised none of her values, morals, or anything. She said what she said and she meant what she said. Mm -hmm. That voice is so needed, especially in representing the black community. The community struggling to understand her loss. I was in shock and disbelief and like that, that no, that just sounds ridiculous. Like, how would that happen? And feeling the need to step up. We didn't really get a chance to really grieve at all. It wasn't about grieving. It was about that we wanted to make sure that her legacy and um, the how important she was to this community would be represented well. While she may not physically occupy the same space as she used to, the people who love her say her spirit never truly left. She is still the voice inside my head when I think about big decisions, when I think about um, moves that I'm making. Memories shared are cemented in time. When she laughed, like, that was a treat. Playing dominoes, like, you know, having a good time. She's funny, but it's just that dry kind of funny very stuff. Dry. It's very dry, but she she's fun to be around. And Pat's always gonna dance. If we have music on, she's just gonna dance wherever. And every now and then, she will be able to drag Sandy to get up and dance. But Pat's gonna dance no matter what. Now, Sandy too has become a memory, but people say this memory will transcend time. So future generations know Sandy Williams the mentor. She was one who was like on her way up, but she was always reaching back to pull you along with her. So I'm, I hope to do that for other folks. The leader. She made her vision so clear. And the friend. I miss Sandy so much. I don't even have the words. Yeah, I miss her so much. Now, Sandy was also a huge part of the LGBTQ community. She was actually at the very first Spokane Pride event back in 1992, started the EWU Pride Center, and was the executive director of the Odyssey Youth Movement. Esteban Jarabia with the Spokane Pride says that her work was vital to the community. Just thinking about the impact and where she comes from and the story that she had, it, it, it like, there was nobody else. And she was changing it, and she was not afraid to change it. She was not afraid to speak her mind, and. We have evidence of her writings, we have re evidence of her ad advocacy, and like, it's, uh, it's beyond special. Now because of all of that work, Spokane Pride actually made Sandy Grand Marshal of the 2019 Spokane Pride Parade. Now looking forward, Spokane Pride is creating a scholarship in Sandy's name, and they're making her the first recipient of their new Pride Champion Award. Now, it's definitely safe to say that Sandy was such a huge part of the Spokane community, from every organization that she touched to all of the countless lives that she impacted throughout her, her work in all of these numerous organizations. But it's so interesting that you actually got to sit down with some of her close friends and really closest allies. Was there anything interesting that they shared with you? Yeah, absolutely. The entire conversation we had uh, was super interesting. Just to know more about Sandy from the people who loved her outside of her immediate family. Um, I think the funniest thing they shared with me was how direct and to the point she was because that was something I also experienced. Uh, one of my first interactions when I came to Spokane was going up to Sandy at an event and saying, hi, my name's Janelle Finch. I'm a reporter with Creme 2 News. And she said, I know who you are. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so it was funny to hear that back from her friends that she was always just that blunt and straightforward with everybody because I experienced that myself. That was my first and my last interaction with Sandy. So I'm glad that the memory that I have of her uh, resonates with the people that truly knew her best. Absolutely. Well, Janelle, thanks so much for telling that story. And of course, thank you so much for sharing your own story with Sandy as well.
Still ahead, we take a look back at the impact the Black Lens had on the Spokane community and hear from Sandy herself on why it meant so much to her. Sometimes it can feel a little isolating in Spokane to connect to the larger Black community, so I try my best to find out some things that are going on, not just locally, but around the country and, and help us connect to those things. Welcome back to this Crim 2 News special, Sandy Story, celebrating civil rights activist Sandy Williams. I'm Channing Curtis. And I'm Janelle Finch. In 2015, the Black Lens started offering news in a different perspective, telling stories for Black people by Black people. Two years ago, Crim 2's Brandon T. Jones spoke with Sandy about the Black Lens and its significance. Let's take a step back in time and hear more from Sandy about the Black Lens and her own words. How are you feeling today? Good. Yes. Same old, same old, just scrambling. The Black Lens newspaper has amplified voices in Spokane for six years. I, I, I pulled the copy out, yay! Every February, Sandy Williams takes pride in this particular issue that's released. Sometimes it can feel a little isolating in Spokane to connect to the larger Black community, so I try my best to find out some things that are going on not just locally, but around the country and, and help us connect to those things. With a schedule that constantly keeps her moving, she somehow finds a way to capture untold stories while also shining a light on people doing important work. And the NAACP did a good story um, where they're highlighting local black people. A lot has happened since last February. First, a pandemic shut down the world in March. Then a few months later, George Floyd was killed turning Black Lives Matter into a conversation that shook Americans into taking a closer look at what justice means in our country. We came through what I call a long, dark winter for the Black community in particular. In this latest paper, Sandy went back and forth about what her front page should include. A new president was sworn into office last month, but it was a young poet with a message that resonated with this issue the most. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade. But I think that sort of kick-started Black History Month, um, looking backwards at where we, what we came through, what we just survived. Black History Month is about honoring people that helped build this country, even through 400 years of slavery, 100 years of segregation and Jim Crow, perseverance and strength describes the black experience. That's what's important because that's the legacy that we came from. Support for Black Lens continues to grow throughout the city. A new issue is released every month of the year. From Spokane, Brandon T. Jones, Crim 2 News. Still ahead, what's next for the Black Lens? I wasn't gonna let it die. That didn't mean I was going to run it. It meant that I was gonna do all the blocking and tackling so that ever whoever would, wouldn't have to worry about some things. It's well known that Sandy worked tirelessly to amplify voices through the Black Lens, a newspaper that focused on issues pertaining to the Black community. In 2022, Sandy put the paper on a hiatus with the intention of starting back up again this month. But even though Sandy is gone, her mission of telling news from a different perspective will live on thanks to another local newspaper. The Black press mattered to me. It was it's something I'd studied in college and I'd written papers about and I knew how special it was that Spokane had one. Rob Curley, editor of the Spokesman Review, knew how special the work Sandy Williams was doing with the Black Lens long before he met her. And the idea that this woman uh, starts a paper from scratch in a predominantly white community, uh, you know, the first thing I met her was and told her, I, I can't, this is amazing. You're crazier than me, and I love that. I don't get to meet people who are off. And she starts laughing, she's got that big laugh that's so fun, and we just became friends. As a newcomer to Spokane, Curly would turn to her for perspective on the community. She would often be the person that you call and say, I don't think I understand what's going on here. Can you explain it to me? And, you know, I didn't have to tell her. It was off the record. I, I wasn't talking to her as the editor and publisher of The Black Lens. I was talking to her as my friend who lived here as well as during times of civil unrest. During the Black Lives Matters protest, we began running the Black Lens in the Spokesman Review. This had never been done in an American Daily newspaper before, where a community, a black community paper was now gonna be published in the Daily, and it was because we needed that voice. Eventually it became a monthly, then a quarterly partnership between the two papers that continued even when Sandy had to put the Black Lens on hold. She had said that she really needed to focus on the Carl Maxey Center. It was close to being ready and it just needed to have her full attention. 
and that, that that meant that the Black Lens couldn't get her full attention. The Black Lens was supposed to return to stands in February, but then on September 4th, the unthinkable happened. When I was asked to speak at her funeral, I, I, I literally said, I don't, I don't think I'm the right person, you know? And, and I kept being told that I was. And every time I tried to write what I was gonna say, I would kind of start crying. And I'm like, I can't. So literally, I wrote down like three things and I tried to keep saying them in my head. He said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, let me tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to let the black lens die. So. I hadn't told the family. I hadn't told anyone, you know, but this is what I was going to do. I wasn't going to let it die. That didn't mean I was going to run it. It meant that I was going to do all the blocking and tackling so that ever, whoever would wouldn't have to worry about some things. Now, with the blessing of Sandy's family, funding through grants and the helping hand of Gonzaga, the Black Lens will be back in publication soon. Everything depends upon the funding, but we hope that it's funded by, uh, by the summer, but we can launch it in sometime in the summer. And Sandy's dream will be able to live on. The, the hole that was left with her death was powerful because you had this, in my mind, there were these three individuals that built the infrastructure. You had, uh, Betsy, who could help with the legislation. And then you had Count Duncan, who was this bigger than life and, and really charismatic. And then you just had Sandy, who just took no prisoners. It was like, how do you replace any of these three? Well, now we have to figure out how we're going to replace one of those three. Thank you so much for joining us for Sandy's story, remembering a community activist. I'm Channing Curtis, and for more information on Sandy Williams or any of the organizations that we've mentioned this evening, you can head to our website at crim.com.